demand avoidance can be caused by lots of things, right? Like I don't want to get my shoes on because they hurt my feet. Sensory. I don't want to get my shoes on because I don't know which step in the routine it is. Maybe that's executive functioning. I don't, didn't understand I needed to get my shoes on. Social communication difference. I don't want to get my shoes on because you told me to. Survival drive for autonomy, right? So it's like we can see the surface level indicators, but understanding that root cause is so important to support kids in the way that they need to be supported. I'm Debbie Reber, and welcome to Tilled Parenting, a podcast featuring interviews and conversations aimed at inspiring, informing, and supporting parents raising differently wired kids. I'm really happy to be bringing another conversation about PDA to the show, especially as awareness and understanding of this complex profile of autism is growing, and more and more parents are looking for resources to navigate this especially challenging parenting journey. Oh, and in case you're not familiar with PDA, It's an acronym that technically stands for Pathological Demand Avoidance, though many people who identify as PDAers prefer the words Persistent Desire for Autonomy. My guest for today's conversation is Casey Ehrlich, a social scientist who only four years ago was leading a team of researchers at a large nonprofit in Washington, D.C. until her world fell apart. In response to her autistic son's increasingly challenging meltdowns and after he stopped eating, walking, and speaking, Casey pivoted her life and spent a year as a full-time caregiver, mother, and researcher of her child. When she came across pathological demand avoidance, suddenly everything made sense. Today, Casey is a coach and educator to parents raising PDA children and teens, the founder of At Peace Parents, and the co-host of a podcast by the same name. She brings her background in social science, methodology, and research to take an objective and non-judgmental approach to supporting families. And as you'll hear from our chat, she is an incredibly validating, supportive presence who any parent raising a PDA child would benefit from. In our conversation, Casey sheds light on how to approach raising a child with PDA at different stages, explores the differences between PDA and ODD, considers how burnout manifests in someone with PDA, and explains how a child with a PDA profile might experience a loss of autonomy and equality on a daily basis. Casey also walks us through her framework for supporting families with PDA kids and what it takes to find peace and acceptance in showing up for a PDA child no matter what. I hope you enjoy our conversation. So let's get right to it. Here's Casey Ehrlich on Parenting a Child with PDA. Hey, Casey, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Debbie. Thanks for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. I was mentioning this before I hit record, but your name has been coming up in my community for quite a while, specifically surrounding your work on PDA. And so I had to do kind of a deep dive into you and what you're doing right now. But my listeners haven't done that. Could you tell us a little bit about what you're doing right now, kind of your work in the world? Sure. So right now I run a business called At Peace Parents, which focuses specifically on supporting parents to raise and care give for their PDA children and teens through an accommodation lens, which just means focusing on supports for the nervous system and providing autonomy and equality. And I'm happy to talk specifically about how to do this (laughs) in order to bring cumulative nervous system activation down, for example, if they're in burnout, and help them create new neural pathways to stay in the thinking brain more so they can access learning and growth. And so it's a long-term approach, but I bring my academic background to support parents to experiment with a different way of being with their child. And it started about three plus years ago with another mom, actually, who I met on the Tilt Parenting Forum on Facebook. Yeah, I posted, I think I have a PDA child and I'm looking for any information on a service dog and this is where I live. And a bunch of people responded, but one woman responded, I don't know anything about service dogs, but I think I'm 20 minutes away from you. So let's meet. And then we started a project together called PDA Parents, which precedes the business. And we did a podcast season together 
really about the parent experience. And it just sort of evolved from there. Okay, I love that story. It always makes me so happy to find out that people found each other and up leveled through Tilt, especially the Facebook group that makes me so happy. So thank you for sharing that. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more than about your own personal experience, because even three years ago, when you posted that, like PDA was, I did an episode with Dr. Melissa Neff, I don't remember, it was probably four years ago. And she was one of the first people that I knew of who was even talking about it in the United States. So this is still very emerging in terms of visibility and understanding. But can you tell us a little bit about your personal journey with PDA? Sure. So my son, when he was about four and a half, reached nervous system burnout, which was something that I didn't recognize at all or understand. So he had always been challenging. (laughs) And I always felt like on a deep, deep level, I was failing him as a mother because starting when he was born, I couldn't soothe him. And that's like the most basic need as a mother or like what you're wired to do. You're supposed to be able to stop your child from screaming and crying and provide for their needs. And while I was providing for his needs, I thought he just wouldn't stop crying. And so that began in infancy. And then throughout his young life, like toddlerdom and early age, he was like two different versions of himself. One was with his grandparents and in daycare while I was working full-time in Washington, D.C. at the time. And then at home, he couldn't do anything independently. And I would follow the parenting advice of like, you know, leave things out. So they try things on their own at two and a half. And it was both he was sort of defiant and avoidant, but he also couldn't engage in anything independently, which is something that also stems back to the nervous system, I understand now. But at the time, it was just like, my husband and I would just be like, why do we suck at this so bad? You know, like why why is everyone else just hanging out with their kids and not like improving and entertaining? But things started to escalate with his behavior and I started to apply more traditional parenting lenses like 123 magic, positive discipline and got advice from pediatricians which were really behaviorally oriented strategies, right? And and the response when it wasn't working was Are you doing it consistently? Are you not following through and really putting it back on me? And so I doubled down. And so his trauma really is more about my parenting rather than school or ABA therapy, for example. I see patterns of both in my work. And then my younger son was born and we couldn't provide that constant undivided attention when he was home. And things really escalated to the point where he stopped being two versions and was just melting down, having what I now consider panic attacks, but he appeared as if he was a traumatized child. And so my husband and I were like, did something happen at daycare? Was there abuse? Right? Because he was like, it looked like a feral animal to me, the way he was responding. He was scared of us. Like if we tried to come near and soothe him and he stopped eating and he stopped walking and he stopped speaking largely. So it seemed like a regression in some ways, but it was also not within the normal patterns of like what I had read about autism. It was terrifying. And I decided to leave my career in Washington, D.C. And we moved to Michigan so I could be close to my family. And I spent the next couple years as a full-time caregiver. And applying my academic prowess and doctorate to understanding my son. So that was a combination of like learning from autistic and neurodivergent testimonies, a lot of them on social media. So I went to social media like an ethnographer of like what is happening internally with my son. The trauma literature, child development literature, like Dr. Dan Siegel, Tina Payne Bryson, and polyvagal theory, and then my own tracking and lived experience. So those are like the three things I was looking at. But I started with sensory processing disorder. So when I first moved to Michigan, I was actually writing a secret blog about sensory processing disorder. And I was like, but I can't really explain the why. You know, like this doesn't explain it. Like I'm getting him the fidgets. I'm getting him the weighted blanket. 
I'm getting him the compression shirts and all the OT and it's just not helping. And in some ways making it worse. And then during the pandemic, the very beginning of the pandemic, my OT was like, have you looked into PDA? And I was like, no, and I'm not going to (laughs) because I've had enough acronyms and enough information. And then finally, four months later, I like posted that in Tilt. And then me and this other mom, I remember meeting on her front step outside because it's the pandemic. And it was just like the veil lifted because every single thing was the same for our families. And then we found other moms in our area. And that was sort of the beginning because it was like, oh, I'm not crazy. This is actually a unique pattern of behavior and experience. And that's how everything sort of started. And I'm still learning. Now I learn a lot from the parents I work with because I'd say at least 20% are PDA identifying moms or dads. So I'm a researcher. So like the sample size keeps getting bigger and my depth of understanding from them and their children's experience keeps getting bigger. So I hope to share that with people. So when you say the parents you're working with, 20%, they themselves identify as being PDA? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Thank you, first of all, for sharing your story. There were so many things in there that really felt familiar to my experience, including that why do we suck at this so badly phase, which we went through. I'm sure so many parents listening to this have gone through. And this idea that if you're not having success when you're doing X, Y, and Z, you're doing it wrong. And that to me makes me think about ODD, right? I don't know if that we got exactly ODD. I think it was like, it was disruptive. And it was something in there is something in that family of really lovely pathology. Yeah. But it was very much focused on the parenting experience and that this is something that's coming up because of the way that you're showing up for this child or not showing up for them or that you're doing this wrong. And you're actually like creating this dynamic. So I want to talk with you about PDA versus ODD. And we're going to take a quick break and we'll get right to that. Maybe I've watched too many seasons of The Amazing Race, but every time I have to go somewhere on the subway, I treat it like a competition. It's all about making the right gut decisions about which route will get me there the fastest. Sometimes those decisions get me where I'm going early and other times my gambles don't really pay off. Probiotics can't help with most gut decisions, but if your gut needs a little support, Ritual has your back. Their Symbiotic Plus, a three-in-one supplement, has clinically studied prebiotics, probiotics, and a postbiotic to support a balanced gut microbiome. I've been using Symbiotic Plus for about six months now, and it's become a core part of my morning routine. I take the mini capsule every morning while making my way through my inbox, whether I'm at home or I'm on the road, because it doesn't need to be refrigerated. And the capsule itself is delayed released, which helps it survive the harsh conditions of the upper GI tract for delivery to the colon. And that's exactly where we want it to go. Ritual invested in a study modeling the human colon, which showed that Symbiotic Plus significantly increased microbial diversity and the growth of beneficial bacteria. There's no more shame in your gut game. Symbiotic Plus and Ritual are here to celebrate, not hide your insides. Get 25% off your first month for limited time at ritual.com slash tilt. Start Ritual or add Symbiotic Plus to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash tilt for 25% off. During this month of planning and organization for big transitions, rhythms and routines have been absolutely essential for our physical and emotional well-being. So Green Chef nights are reliably and predictably a good night. We know the ingredients will be fresh and prepped, the instructions easy to follow, and the meal delicious. We're all still talking about last week's turkey tacos with mango chimichurri sauce, refried beans, and Monterey Jack cheese. Green Chef contributes to a healthy lifestyle with easy and delicious menus like fresh seasonal salads and grain bowls, and with over 80 weekly meal and market options, plus rotating options to suit a variety of lifestyles, whether Mediterranean, plant-based, calorie-smart, keto, protein-packed, gluten-free, there are always plenty of options to choose from. Whatever you select, you'll get farm-fresh ingredients, organic whole fruits and veggies, and premium proteins all delivered straight to your door. I love those four words straight to my door. 
Oh, and one more thing I love about Green Chef, they have an app, which means it's easy to manage meal preferences and delivery from your phone if you want to. And I, for one, want to. I am in that mode where I'm making the most of little moments like waiting in line at the pharmacy or for the F train to pull into the station to tackle all of those to-dos. So the convenience of an app is key for me. Green Chef has a special offer for Tilt listeners. Go to greenchef.com slash Tilt50 and use code Tilt50 to get 50% off plus 20% off your next two months. That's 50% off plus 20% off your next two months when you use the code Tilt50 at greenchef.com slash Tilt50. So right before we went to the break, I was talking about this idea of ODD, which I think is something that a lot of families get that label for their child. I know it's very controversial. I know how I feel about it, but I'm not a psychotherapist, but I'd love to know your thoughts on PDA and ODD. Does PDA need to replace ODD? Like, How do you see them kind of relating to each other? Yeah. So I remember hearing on the Tilt Parenting podcast, you didn't know I was like such a big fan, did you? I did not know. (laughs) Bring it on. (laughs) Bring it on. (laughs) Riding the Metro to my job in Washington, D.C. and hearing Mona Delahook say, I do not believe in oppositional defiant disorder. And I was like, wow, bold. And I want to know more. But at that time, I didn't know how much it would overlap in my world. So that was, you know, four years ago. I think there's two things I'll say, and and I do want to caveat in the same way you did, because I'm not a clinician. I'm not a psychotherapist. It's not my discipline. So I need to be humble (laughs) in how I talk about this. However, I think one way to think about it, if a parent is confused, is that PDA's root cause is the neuroception of threat, right? Of like anytime there's a perception of a loss of autonomy, freedom and choice, or a loss of equality, the subconscious autonomic part of the brain will tell the nervous system, hey, keep us alive, right? So it's either fight, flight, or freeze. And those come with like physiological processes, right? Like fight flight is like adrenaline, cortisol, blood rushing to the extremities. You might have diarrhea or throw up in the way that I felt before this podcast because I'm like, okay, fight flight. Like I need to run away from the lion. And so this is not under anyone's control. It's a survival mechanism and it's prompted by this neuroception. And so it's not just behavior. If you look at it, it's actually really impacting these kids' basic needs, which is not talked about at all in the DSM-5 with oppositional defiant disorder. And what you see, even if the child is not in burnout, is a lot of medical practitioners looking at things like the child not eating or the child needing to co-sleep well past the age of eight, a toileting regression as siloed from this nervous system experience of PDA and only looking at the behavior. And so the first thing I would say is like, if you're confused, I would encourage a parent to look at like, how are the basic needs impacted? Right? Are there social communication and sensory differences? Because ODD really just talks about these surface level behaviors without a true explanatory root cause that makes sense across cases, whereas PDA, you can really find that root cause. And then the second thing I say, which harks back to what you said, Debbie, of like, I'm never going to tell a parent like something you're doing is making it wrong, right? So like, if someone's working through an ODD lens, and it's helping their connection, it's helping their kid, I'm never going to be like, you're wrong, right? Or you shouldn't do that. What I do want to encourage empower parents to do is to take an experimental lens of like, my hypothesis is ODD. They've asked me to consistently apply this behavioral protocol, observe the data in your home. And if it's getting worse, you can infer that maybe that's not the correct root cause. And then we can experiment with something different that's more accommodating. And then we can track of like, Are the basic needs better? Is the connection you feel with them better? Are they hugging you for the first time in a year? Are their meltdowns going down? And that's when we really have to tune in to our own intuition and capacity as parents to like trust ourselves, right? I'm trained in the scientific method. So I try and bring that to parents of like, you can do this. You can track your own data. Is it working? 
Yeah, I love that researcher lens that being curious and taking note, observing, seeing what you're doing, but it's also non-judgmental because you're learning, you're figuring things out. There's no expectation that you are going to do it right or understand this from day one. Totally. First of all, thank you for that. That makes so much sense. And I do remember when Mona Delahook, she shared a post where she kind of came out and said, I don't think ODD is a thing. I'm going to include a link to that in the show notes page for readers to check it out. But You've mentioned burnout a couple of times. You talked about nervous system burnout and you recognize this in your child. Is nervous system burnout the same thing as autistic burnout? I'm curious to know if you could define that for us and explain what it looks like or what it could look like. Absolutely. So I'm not an expert in the autistic experience. I don't identify as autistic and I only work with families who believe their child to be PDA. And so from my understanding, autistic burnout is very similar and overlapping in some ways to PDA burnout of like all the demands, all the masking, having their own survival response to a neuronormative world where they're sensing and perceiving they don't belong, which like obviously shuts down the nervous system and creates burnout. That's my understanding from other people's perspectives of their lived experience. My understanding in the PDA space is really that the brain is constantly perceiving threat because of these losses of autonomy and equality throughout the day, even if you can't see the nervous system reaction. And so this happens a lot with kids in school, for example. They're internalizing their threat response. They're masking the threat response, not just imitating neurotypical norms. And so it's building in the system. And then you have a threshold for how much your nervous system can be activated before you're at risk of trauma. That's true for anybody, right? But these kids are constantly perceiving threat. We're not perceiving it as parents unless we have the PD experience. And so what we suddenly see is what looks like a regression. It looks like a child stopping eating. It looks like a child who has suddenly moved into a space that is way beyond behavior. And I think one of the reasons it's so hard to understand in the medical field, for example, is like, I'll give you an example of my son versus another family I worked with when they reached burnout. So my son has an externalized expression of his nervous system activation, which is fight, flight, defiance, opposition, screaming, hitting, kicking, all the things, right? So he's defiant and explosive and he stops eating and he stops speaking and he says his legs don't work, but he's toileting fine and he's sleeping fine, right? And then you have another little girl, the same age who ends up in the ER because she's all of a sudden not able to sleep at all like days. She is having trouble accessing hygiene. She's eating fine. And she also says her legs don't work. And she has an internalized expression. So she's just shutting down and disassociating. To a doctor or a nurse or a therapist, this looks very different, right? Like those two kids don't look the same. And so that's why really understanding what's going on inside the nervous system and understanding all the different indicators of what it can look like, especially, you know, even between like kids and teens is so important for parents because they might have to be the ones of like, no, it's not IBS. It is actually an indicator of like nervous system activation or like a not necessarily the diet that's causing constipation, but the kid who's going into freeze over and over, the metabolism slowing down. So that's how I think about PDA burnout is really to help others identify it. And because, you know, I've experienced my own nervous system burnout and trauma, but not as an autistic adult, just as like someone who has panic disorder and a trauma history. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I think as you're talking, I'm reflecting on the conversation I had with Dr. Megan Ananaf about just how important it is to really understand the root cause of anxiety, for example, that if it's anxiety as a result of PDA or an autistic experience or some sort of neurodivergence that's very different than just a generalized anxiety disorder that is outside the context of neurodivergence. And you would treat that very differently if it's like a 
rooted in this nervous system shutdown that is a result of all of these other things. It's so complex. And I think we can talk about this a little later. I think it's really hard to find people who really understand the nuances and why it is so important to understand that underlying cause and that that's what we're focusing on. Yeah, I agree so much with the with the root cause because, you know, if we look at the name pathological demand avoidance, it's like demand avoidance can be caused by lots of things, right? Like I don't want to get my shoes on because they hurt my feet. Sensory. I don't want to get my shoes on because I don't know which step in the routine it is. Maybe that's executive functioning. I don't didn't understand I needed to get my shoes on. Social communication difference. I don't want to get my shoes on because you told me to. Survival drive for autonomy, right? So it's like we can see the surface level indicators, but understanding that root cause is so important to support kids in the way that they need to be supported. Great examples. I want to talk about this idea of loss of autonomy and equality, which you've talked about a couple of times, and we'll do that right after this quick break. Hey there, it's Debbie. I love making this show and sharing conversations about how to support our awesome neurodivergent kids. I've seen how even one little insight from an interview can spark a big shift in daily life. But I know that raising complex kids can be messy and lonely. And just when we think we figured it out, something comes up that boots us right back to feeling overwhelmed and stuck. That's why I've poured everything into creating a way for parents like us navigating complex parenting journeys to join together and chart a path that feels positive, hopeful, and doable. It's the brand new Differently Wired Club experience. In the club, you'll get personal support from me and other seasoned parent coaches, six live calls every month where you can connect and get your personal questions answered, the opportunity to learn directly from authors and experts like I have on this show, monthly themes for getting specific and tactical, an exclusive private podcast feed, and the best, most generous community of parents. Seriously, these folks show up for themselves and each other, and that right there is really everything. Because it's a daily reminder that we're not alone. Our kids aren't broken, and we have totally got this. The recently rebooted Differently Wired Club is on a brand new platform with its very own iOS and Android app. It is such a great space. However you learn, whatever your style, no matter the ages, genders, and neurodivergent profile of your children, the Differently Wired Club can help you cultivate the positive shifts you're hoping for. Join us today by going to tiltparenting.com slash club. That's tiltparenting.com slash club. I hope to see you on the inside. Hey, are you a parent of a teenager? Are you feeling overwhelmed about how to be what they need while also holding limits and boundaries that keep them safe? Are you tired of conversations that negate how messy this season of parenting is? Well, I've got you. My name is Casey O'Rourke. I am a positive discipline trainer, parent coach, and the host of the Joyful Courage podcast. Every week I come to you with an interview, digging into tough topics with experts I trust and solo shows that go deep into the personal growth and mindset needed to raise teens in a way that grows them into confident, capable young people. I am not afraid of getting real about the intersection of conscious parenting and the teen years, while also bringing in vulnerability, humor, and lightness. I'm walking the path with you and honored to serve. Listen to Joyful Courage on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you consume podcasts. Okay, so you've mentioned a couple of times this concept of someone with a PDA profile really experiencing that loss of autonomy and equality. Could you explain what you mean by that? I haven't heard those exact phrases. I guess loss of autonomy I have, but I want to have a better understanding of what you mean when you talk about those concepts. Sure. And so I want to be clear that I didn't make this up. I learned it from adult PDA autistic advocates, right? So like the writings on neuroclastic, Christy Forbes, although he's problematic, Harry Thompson, Sally Cat, and just lots of writing out there about autonomy, equality, right? And so what's unique about the PDA brain is that the nervous system reacts with this root cause, right? And this is why it's also called pervasive drive for autonomy. And so when there's 
a perceived loss of having a choice in a situation. Like, let me give you an example with my son. If I say, like, we're going to go to the grocery store, it's not just that he doesn't want to go. His brain will actually perceive that request without choice as like, there's a lion in front of me on a subconscious level. And so he'll have activation. How big that activation shows externally depends on how much cumulative stress he has. And because we accommodate, it might just be like, I'm not going rather than a huge meltdown or throwing and kicking and biting, which it would have been years ago. But if I just say, using declarative language, thank you, Linda K. Murphy, hey, guys, I'm going to head to the grocery store. It's like, I'm stating what I'm doing. I'm not telling anyone they need to come. I'm not putting myself above them or like I'm the authority. I'm just managing myself. He might say, okay, can I come? Because he has autonomy and his threat response didn't go off, right? But it's happening all the time, right? Like currently he's in a tackle football team. His special interest is football. He's obsessed, right? Like he collects the cards. He knows the stats. He watches YouTube videos. He goes to the Michigan football games. Like he listens to the songs. It's a special interest, which is regulating for him. At the same time, throughout his practice, His brain is subconsciously perceiving threat because he didn't make the play. Another kid is in front of him in line. He didn't get to be the first one, right? So he doesn't feel equal to. So he cognitively knows like, hey, this is what football's like in his frontal lobe. But constantly his body's perceiving threat because of that perception of not being equal to a teammate, the coach, or the situation. And so it is a disability because it disables him from participating. And it can disable a child in accumulation from being able to eat or sleep or toilet independently. Another example I like to use, which is a clear one, is the survival drive for autonomy and equality being overriding other survival instincts in the moment. So I'll use an example from not my own life, but another family. I've heard multiple families have this resonate with them where their child was getting close to a river or a body of water. And the parent was like, hey, don't go near the water. And the more they tried to gently usher them away from the water, there was actually like a fixation on getting into and under the water. Right, So the survival drive for autonomy is overriding the, the instinct to stay alive. And like that's a very like specific example, but it's, it can happen in accumulation where it overrides the instinct to eat, where it overrides the instinct to sleep when you're tired. So that's what I mean by that. I'm happy to give more examples. Like parents might see it in like, why does my child like impulsively and reflexively fight past their sibling to get out the door of the van every morning, no matter how many times I tell them, and they'll melt down if I prevent them or they'll hurt their sibling. It's not that they don't want, it's their brain perceives threat when the sibling is first because it's not equal. Or if they're playing a game and as soon as someone else starts to win, they start to escalate or change the rules or cheat but in an impulsive, reflexive way every time, not because they don't cognitively understand or have the skills to play the game, but because their subconscious is like, hey, you're going to die, do something to get back to safety, which is the equalizing behavior of like cheating or changing the rules or controlling others. It's so fascinating. Those examples were super helpful. And you mentioned Linda Murphy's work, and we've had her on the show, and I really love her book, The Declarative Language Handbook. So that is one approach when parenting or supporting a child with a PDA profile. I'm curious if you could share a little bit about your methodology for working with parents raising PDA kids at Peace Parenting? Like, what do you do to help them? Because it is a tricky journey for sure. Oh, yeah. (laughs) So I have what's called a 5A framework. So we have awareness, which is sort of what we've been talking about, about like, how does this all work? Like, what part of the brain is activating? Why do they do this and not this? So that's like the first 
step. And, and this is both for my programs, but also how I coach families. Then we have acceptance, which is like radically accepting one thing, which is you're either activating or accommodating your child. And that doesn't leave a lot of room, right? Parents might spend the entire time we coach or the entire program, like we're still coming back to that. Like you're still looking for option C or a strategy to make that not your choice point, right? And that aspect is like within that, if we can accept this, then we can work through a cost-benefit decision-making framework and we can place it within the family system of like the cost of setting a boundary is this the benefit of this for the child. Like the cost of setting a boundary or saying no or a limit will be nervous system activation. The cost will be different depending on where you are in your journey, if the child's in burnout, et cetera. Then we place it into the cost benefit of the family system. Are there siblings? Is the mom in burnout? Does she have childhood trauma? Is she neurodivergent? Is she PDA? Right? Can she unschool? Yes, maybe the cost of school is too high for the PDA or but what's if the cost to the mom is like she's going to end up in the hospital then we have to make a different decision right and then we go through accommodations which is I work through an experimental framework with families of like we test it we track it not everything's going to work well for your family but that doesn't mean you're doing it wrong as we said earlier so there's 12 accommodations that we work through Autonomy is one, but how do we provide autonomy? Equality is another. Co-regulation of the nervous system, drawing on the trauma literature of like, how do we actually signal safety without words? Paying attention to our facial expression, our tone, our movement. What can we learn from polyvagal theory, right? Then we have language accommodations of which declarative language is one, but you know, a big one is just not talking to your kid until they talk to you. Which sounds so easy. <laughs> yeah, it's so hard, but yet so simple yet so challenging, right? So there's nine proactive accommodations, and then there's three responsive ones, which is like diffusion, de escalation, and risk mitigation. Like, what if my kid's hurting the sibling? What if they're pulling a knife on me? I mean, this stuff happens in this space. And then we work on affirmation, which is using all these accommodations to build towards guiding your child or teen towards an autonomously decided upon identity and a process for naming the threat response. So we parse those two so they're not coupled. And this has been really helpful because then the child can talk about like, this is how my nervous system works. I'm PDA or not identify as PDA, full autonomy, right? And then advocacy of like, how do we set boundaries? How do we use nonviolent communication to ask for what we need? How do we use the cost benefit again? So that's like the methodology. When I'm coaching families, we get a lot more into like the root cause of why it's so hard as a parent, which might be childhood stuff. And then I refer to experts of like, okay, if your kid also has pans and pandas and they're with a clinic, like we're going to be bringing in their expertise and putting the putting the PDA lens into the game. And you're as a parent going to have to decide how to apply it because there's two things going on. So that's the work I do primarily. It's such a great framework. Thank you so much for giving us the bullet points of it. It makes total sense. And I'm assuming it's not like a linear, it's probably very fluid back and forth throughout it as you're working with families. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I mean, honestly, I'll say, even for me, it's always coming back to that radical acceptance of just like, this is a disability. I do have constraints that I can't change. How can I find expansion and freedom within those constraints? Because a lot of this is accepting, as I'm sure you know, Debbie, like, your life looking really different than you expected, whether it's finances, career, geographic location, et cetera. Yeah, this is so fascinating. And I'm really like the people who've been talking about working with you, it's all kind of making sense. I can see how you're giving such a thoughtful and a safe accepting container for parents to navigate what can feel really overwhelming and isolating if you're going through this. So 
I, I love that framework. And I do want to talk just briefly about this idea of no demands, right? So this is something we've had Amanda Diekman on the show who wrote the book, Low Demand Parenting. We covered this in my Differently Wired Club as a theme, low demand parenting. It was a very controversial topic to be discussing. And one of the things that was really hard for parents to wrap their head around is what does it actually look like with the PDA child? Yeah. And long term. And it was this very like all or nothing. Could you talk a little bit about the nuance of that? Yeah, sure. Okay. So I view lowering demands as one of 12 potential accommodations. I also view it a little bit differently because it's often viewed as like, okay, we can't. And I viewed this, I want to just say like, this is what I thought too at the beginning, right? Of like, oh my gosh, my kid's in burnout. He doesn't want to do anything except being on a screen. So I can't ask him to do anything. And I can't, you know, we can't go outside. We're out of, we're starting to get out of burnout. So like, I, I don't want to put the demand on him of like going to a pool or doing X, Y, or Z. And then I realized like, it's not the demand itself. It's the autonomy and the equality, right? So like, if he has a choice and he gets dopamine and can intersect with a special interest, he often loves to go do activities, which have become, I think, And I'm not saying this is how Amanda presented them, just like in the interwebs. It's like, oh, a demand is anything that places any pressure on a child. And I like to think of lowering demands as more like a fluid practice that is a reflection of cumulative nervous system activation and is something that you can physically do for your child that they may be able to do for themselves. So for example, brushing their teeth, putting their shoes on, picking up a Twix wrapper that they throw on the ground. In burnout, I did that always for my son. However, I now use it as like a fluid practice of like, oh, nervous system stress is high at the end of the week. He's gone to football and school. And so I'm going to say, hey, I can brush your teeth for you. Like strewing an offer of a lower demand to reflect his fluctuating nervous system stress. The other thing I want to say is like, A, I think it's really important to track your child's regulation levels in a dynamic way, especially once you're out of burnout, as if you're like a parent tracking insulin levels for a diabetic child. And so we can lower demands when they're having a really hard week. If it's, you know, the holiday season and there's all this stress in the background and expectation, we might lower some demands and provide more accommodations then. But it's not like we just drop demands and then we, we, never do anything for the rest of their lives. And then second, we have to think of it sequentially and intersecting with the connection and trust you have with them. Because I know that it's kind of a dirty word in the neurodiversity space, but I feel like there is room long-term for some exposure and encouragement and resilience premised on and grounded in the connection and trust that you have demonstrated. Like, I'll never make you do anything. Right. Like, I had to go through that period of full autonomy and lowering demands and all the accommodations to signal to my son, like, I will accommodate you, but I'm also on your team. And we're going to, you know, if you say, you know, I don't know if I want to go to this water park, but I know you love it and it's going to give you dopamine, I might encourage you a little bit to do the demand of leaving the house. Right. It's a dynamic practice, right? And at its root, it's about knowing your own child. And I think testing out, you know, I provide the framework because it's like experiment with these. Some kids on the distribution of cases I know are like my son and can go to school and sometimes play some sports. We're still on the edge with that one. And other PDA kids or teens They might have comorbidities and other things going on, but they might not be able to handle even school outside of the home because of the nervous system activation. Sorry, that was kind of a long answer, and it's hard to convey nuance on social media, so I get why this is a question. (laughs) Yeah. No, it's great. And I love that explanation of this very fluid dynamic relationship. That's how I see it too. And it could change from minute to minute, from hour to hour, from day to day. And I think it is really about 
being deeply connected and having that fluency, which is something I talk a lot about, just really being fluent in who your kid is and how they experience the world so that we are able to be curious and make those observations so we can kind of gauge what's going on at any given moment. And then we can accommodate or not accommodate depending on the situation or make choices that would support where they are right then and there. Yeah, I love that. Before we kind of wrap up, first of all, I just want to say thank you. This has been such a fascinating conversation and I I really appreciate your lens and the way that you approach this. I think it's very, again, supportive and practical and helpful and hopeful. Is there anything that you haven't shared before we say goodbye that you think would be really important for parents to know if they are raising a child with a PDA profile or they suspect their child has a PDA profile? You're not crazy. (laughs) (laughs) And I know that it's really hard to feel like you're walking on eggshells and sometimes feel as if you're being abused by your child or teen. But from a long-term perspective and working with hundreds of families at this point, I do believe that it's not under your child's control. And over time, you will see the bright light and the divine light of who your child or teen is behind that threat response because that's not who they are. And I believe in you. That's so nice. Thank you. And I'm looking at Casey as she's saying this, and I can say say she really does believe in you. I can see it. Casey, thank you so much for everything you shared today. And could you just let listeners know where the best place to find you and engage with you is online, on social, or anywhere else? Sure. So I think my main platform is Instagram. You can find me there. I actually do a free live every... Tuesday at 9.30 a.m. If people have questions, I just pop on there. It's called Coffee with Casey. So you can find me there. I'm on Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, even though I'm too old for it. I have a podcast at Peace Parents. We still have PDA Parents too, or my website. So I'm all over the place. (laughs) Yeah. Awesome. Well, listeners, I'll have links to all of that in the show notes pages. And I love that you do a little coffee with Casey. I will check that out. And yeah, again, just thank you so much for the work that you're doing. I'm so glad that you have, like so many people I talk to have turned their personal experience into something that is serving so many families. And so thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you for inspiring that journey. You've been listening to the Tilt Parenting Podcast. To go deeper into this episode, visit the extensive show notes page. For every episode, there's a dedicated page on my website with links to all the resources mentioned, a full transcript, and a podcast player with key takeaways marked so you can easily go back and re-listen to the sections you're most interested in. Just go to tiltparenting.com slash podcast and select this episode. The Tilt Parenting Podcast is hosted by me, Debbie Reber, author of the book Differently Wired and the founder of Tilt Parenting. This episode was edited by Andrea Curtis Amasquita, and show notes were put together by myself, Andrea, and Lindsay McFadden. If you get a lot out of this podcast and want to help cover the cost of its production, please consider joining my Patreon campaign. On Patreon, you can sign up to make a small monthly contribution, as little as $2 a month, and it's super easy to sign up. Just go to patreon.com slash parenting to learn more or click on the Patreon link on any show notes page. To follow Tilt Parenting on social media, go to at Tilt Parenting on Instagram and Twitter and on Facebook. Lastly, please help this podcast stay visible and easily found by the listeners who need it by subscribing and leaving a rating or a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Thank you so much. And that's all for this week. Stay safe, stay well, and take good care. And for more information about this podcast or any of the resources that Tilt offers, visit TiltParenting.com. Are you overwhelmed by the things that get in the way of you doing what you want to do? Are you looking for ways to simplify life to better align with your values? Do you want to create space in your schedule so you have room for more of the good stuff? Play, joy, relationships, gratitude, and more? If you answered yes to any of these questions, I invite you to check out Edit Your Life, a podcast to help you edit the unnecessary from your life so you have more room to enjoy the awesome.
Through episodes with me, Christine Co, and a range of super smart, compassionate, and thoughtful guests, you'll come away with big picture insights and practical ways to declutter your home, schedule, and mental space without getting bogged down by perfection. I have always believed that small moments and actions matter tremendously. My goal is to help you find agency and space in your life through doable baby steps that will leave you feeling accomplished instead of overwhelmed. Check out Edit Your Life wherever you enjoy your podcasts.